Welcome to the book of Leviticus, everybody's favorite book, Leviticus. Now, the first thing to realize about Leviticus is that it comes after Exodus, like, like right after Exodus, like the narrative of Exodus is going to flow right into Leviticus. But Exodus is going to give us a bit of a cliffhanger, which we should take a look at. Okay, the cliffhanger in Exodus. The last chapter is chapter 40, and the tabernacle is completed. Let's see, Moses finished the work. And what happens next? It says that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. But it says Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Now this tension here at the end of Exodus is going to be picked up at the beginning of Leviticus in Leviticus 1.1, 1, 1, and then it's also going to be addressed in the beginning of Numbers. Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so here at the end of Exodus, let's scrolly, scrolly, scroll down to Leviticus, and look how it opens. Yahweh called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Okay, it's an important preposition. Let's go to Numbers 1. It says, pretty similar, Yahweh spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. It's a crucial difference right there. So <clears throat> here in the end of Exodus, beginning of Leviticus, um, God is going to speak to Moses from, but then here in Numbers, God is going to speak to Moses in the tent of meeting. Now, tell me, what comes in between Leviticus 1.1 and Numbers 1.1? What's in, in between? Well, it is the whole book of Leviticus. So, Leviticus is... Um, set to answer the question, how can a holy God live in the midst of an unholy, sinful people? And the answer that Leviticus is designed to give is that this sinful people can live among a holy God by practicing ritual sacrifices and feasts, worship, through the mediation of the priests and through observance of ritual purity laws and moral purity laws, and then finally, by the annual Day of Atonement. Now, we kind of see how these things are structured uh, chiastically. So that means that the outer frames are similar. We have ritual sacrifices, and then we have ritual feasts, and you come in one, and you see these are both devoted to priests. So here's the ordination of the priests, their consecration along with the tabernacle. And then we have the priests' qualifications, special rules designed just for them and addressed just to the priests. You come in one more, and you've got ritual purity laws, and then moral purity laws on this other side addressed to the whole nation. And then in the middle, we have the Day of Atonement, chapter 16, um, and then 17 is kind of tagged in there as well. But then at the end, we have the terms of the covenant, an important chapter in 26 and 27 kind of acts as a bit of a appendix. Now, if the central question of the book of Leviticus is how can a holy God live among a sinful people, um, it behooves us to really think about what this word holiness means. So we're going to take a look at the meaning of holiness. Now, here's a question for you. Where do you think is the first time the word holy or holiness is used in the Bible? I'll give you a hint. The burning bush. Now, let's take a look at that episode in Exodus 3. All right, Exodus 3, the burning bush. So here we are. The angel of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of of a bush, and Yahweh's going to speak to Moses, and he says, oh, Moses, Moses, here I am. And then further, he says, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, 
for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. This is the word holy. It's kodesh, holy ground. So here's our word. It is kodesh. So what does holiness mean? Well, this word kodesh, holiness, it has a few different meanings. Very commonly, um, it's described as being set apart or distinct or other from. Let me write that in here, set apart. But it also kind of carries a different meaning of being um, distinct from or separated from um, sin and death. So we're going to put that on the other side of the burning bush. So untainted by sin and death. So let's think about this burning bush episode in Exodus 3. Now, it, it's, it was subtle, but it records that Moses had to do a very specific action in order to ensure that he did not contaminate this pure space with his impurity. Did you catch what it was? What did Moses have to do? He had to take off his sandals, right? So then the book of Leviticus is 27 chapters about how to take off your sandals. Does that make sense? In order to enter um, into this holy space where God is, you have to take off your sandals. So if the book of Leviticus then is a how-to book, have to take off your sandals, that means that the priests, well, they're going to have a little bit of work to do. Let's take a look at what the role of the priests is in Leviticus. Priests in Leviticus. Let's go to Leviticus 10. Verse 10, addressing the priests, it says, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the clean and the unclean, and you are to teach the people of Israel to do the same. And I like how um, Ezekiel 44 describes this. Ezekiel, the person, of course, was a priest, and it says that they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the clean and the unclean. So, um, what is clean and what is unclean? I think the first thing you have to, you know, wrap your head around, because these are kind of weird categories, is that God is going to be the one to make the rules. He's the one that decides what constitutes cleanliness and uncleanliness. And he does so primarily in the book of Leviticus in these chapters here, chapters 11 to 15, our ritual purity chapters. And in these chapters, it describes five different things that could make an Israelite unclean. Um, certain animals were considered unclean. Touching dead bodies would make you unclean. Um, women were unclean for a period of time after childbirth. Um, various forms of leprosy developing either on the skin, or on the clothes, or even on, on buildings. Um, they could have some, some kind of form of mold which could contaminate and make one unclean. Um, and then finally, uh, sexual discharges, both, both male and female, would, would make you unclean. Um, let's take a look at just uh, briefly one of these. Uh, and I got to warn you, it's a little bit graphic. Yep, so Leviticus this is a weird book, huh? Leviticus, let's look at one to three. So Yahweh's going to speak to Moses and Aaron. And he's going to say, when a person has on the skin of his body a swelling or an eruption or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons. The priest shall examine the diseased area. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white, like this is getting nasty, right? The disease appears to be deeper than the skin. Well, it is a case of leprous disease. And it's going to go on like this, like for 60 verses. It's pretty intense. <laughs> Now, it's important to remember, like, this should be a relief. It's important to remember that um, these forms of uncleanliness or um, being unclean, ritually unclean, was not sin. So it's not sin to be unclean. 
So then what is it? And why are all these things on the list? What, what kind of holds them all together? Well, some people have speculated that all these are things that are associated with death. And the kind of idea behind this is that symbols of death, um, like think about Moses, he, he was a, a shepherd, right? He was walking around the sheep, he probably got a bunch of sheep poo on his shoes. You must keep these symbols of death separate from God, who is the author of life. Um, <clears throat> and being unclean is not sin, and it's also not permanent. It is a temporary condition, and all Israelites were aware um, of themselves being in a constant cycle between being clean and unclean. So they were clean, something would happen, they'd get unclean. And then the process for regaining cleanliness, um, ritual purity was, was simple. I mean, oftentimes it would involve sometimes just waiting until the end of the day and then you would be pronounced clean. Um, oftentimes a ritual washing was involved and sometimes you'd have to offer a sacrifice. Um, well, let's take a look at this cycle really briefly. So we wanna look at Leviticus 11, 11, 24. So this is a chapter about unclean animals, and it says that by any of these, you shall become unclean. Whoever touches their carcass shall be unclean temporarily until evening. Then they're clean again. And whoever carries any part of their car carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean again temporarily until evening. It's, it's not, not a big deal. Now, what was a big deal? And what was sinful was to be in this unclean state and then to go into the tabernacle, into God's sacred, holy space. This space is holy. You cannot be unholy, unclean, and enter into this space. And why? Because when you do that, then you contaminate this holy space. It would be as if Moses, after God said, speaking out of the burning bush, take off your sandals for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. And Moses is like, eh, forget about it. I'm going to keep my shoes on. I don't want to you know, have my feet walking in the mud anyways. I'll just waltz right into your presence. You don't do that. It's holy ground. Um, now, jumping over to the other aspect of um, purity, the moral purity, we see that there was a both a moral and a representative aspect for um, cleanliness and unclean and holiness in general. Um, in Exodus 19.6, an extremely important verse, um, Israel is called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And through their obedience, Israel was supposed to put the Torah on display before all nations, and therefore um, they were supposed to be different from all nations. And that's what these um, laws here in these chapters describe them being different from the nations, and that's what constitutes cleanliness. And let me show you how this works in Leviticus 18. All right, so Leviticus 18, um, it says here in the opening, you shall not do as they did in the land of Egypt where you lived. You shall not do as they did in the land of Canaan. Um, but you should follow my laws. Now let's look at the end of chapter 18. Scroll up a bit. It says here, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all these things, the nations that I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean so that I punish its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. So that's what's going on here. and. Just briefly, kind of a structural thing. Um, each of these sections is uh, like you, you can just look at it, and we, we will in a minute. Um, it's going to have these series of lists of laws. So, in this moral purity section, uh, chapters 18 to 20, it's going to have four lists. And then in the priestly qualification section, it's going to have five lists. And these lists are discernible by looking at their introductions. And usually it's going to say, 
and Yahweh said to Moses, gunk. And then go down a few verses, and Yahweh said to Moses, Yahweh said to Moses, more laws. And what's kind of interesting, it's actually really interesting, each of these lists are going to have some multiple of seven laws in them. So one list will have exactly seven laws, and then it'll say, and Yahweh said to Moses. And then the next list will have 14 laws, Yahweh said to Moses, 21 laws. And if you look in these sections, um, they are just littered with the phrase, I am Yahweh. I want to show you that. Take a look. So here we are in Leviticus 18, and we're going to zoom way out. So I have everywhere in green where it says, I am Yahweh your God. I am Yahweh your God. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Yahweh who sanctifies you. Look at this. It's just all over the place. It's part of the kind of characteristic elements of this section of the book of Leviticus. Okay, so let's return for a minute to this whole clean and unclean thing. And let me pose a hypothetical for you. Let's say that you are a fisherman and you're fishing all night because that's what fishermen do. And you're getting a little bit hungry, a little peckish. So you decide to have a fish stew and it's the middle of the night, you can't see a thing. And you're making your little fish stew and you're eating it and you're like, wait, what? And you pull out a leg of a shrimp. Now shrimp, that is an unclean animal, but you just ate an unclean animal. What do you do? Think about this. Here's another hypothetical situation. Let's say that mold, let's say that mold developed on your house and it developed on a Friday. And then on a Saturday, the Sabbath, you go into um, the tabernacle and you worship and it's great. And then the next day, Sunday, you go back home and then you, you pull back the curtains and you realize, oh, there's mold all over the walls. This has been here for days. I've been ritually unclean and I've entered into holy space. What do I do? Now, does God simply say, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. I'll forget about it this time. I can overlook it. No, um, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to realize that this is actually literally holy space where God literally, maybe even physically dwells inside of the Holy of Holies and that the moment you enter into this space in an unclean state, you have contaminated it. Some of its holiness is, is lost because of your contamination of the holy space. So something has to be done. We have to do something that will bring the holiness back to God's dwelling place. Enter the sin offering. Now we're going to talk about offerings for a minute. Let's look at the sin offering, and it's going to pose very similar hypothetical situations. Um, so the sin offering, I want to look in chapter five. Can anybody read this? It's so small. Okay. So hypothetical situation posed by this um, necessity of a sin offering. Five verse two. Let's say if anyone touches an unclean thing, whether it's a carcass of an animal or something else, a uh, swarming thing perhaps, and it's hidden from him, he's not aware of it, and then he becomes unclean, but later he realizes his guilt. Hmm. Um, or say that he touches human uncleanness, but he doesn't realize that it's hidden from him. And when he comes to know it, he realizes his guilt. What is he supposed to do? Well, there is a God-ordained solution to this problem. Look at verse 5. When he realizes his guilt, step one, confess the sin. It still calls it sin. Isn't it interesting? Even though it's um, something that is unintentional. Um, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation the female from the flock for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him and for, for his sin. So um, the sin offering, it does two things. One, it's going to atone for the individual who entered sacred space, but then it's also going to decontaminate. Let's see if I can spell that word. Oh, that's a long word. It's going to decontaminate. It's going to make holy again, reconsecrate this sacred space. And let me show you kind of what I mean by that. Because there are some complicated words I'm throwing at you. Decontamination of sacred space? What's that all about? Okay, here's a little uh, kind of PDF presentation I have for you to describe 
sacred space and the decontamination of that space. So here is the um, tabernacle space, 50 cubits by 100 cubits, um, looks a little something like this. And the purpose of the sin offering, as described by um, this guy E. Ray uh, Clendenden, um, he says that the sin offering was designed to purify the sanctuary. That's its purpose, he says, to purify the sanctuary from sin that was committed unintentionally and thereby allow God to continue dwelling with his people. All right, I want to focus on this. This is big. To allow God to continue dwelling with his people. See all these silly little boxes and triangles out here? The, this is the, um, the tribes of Israel, all, all the 12 tribes surrounding in the very center God's space. He's living in the middle of them. And they are oftentimes sinful and unclean. And how is he going to stay there in the middle of his people where he desires to be? Um, he's got a, uh, the person has to offer a sin offering, it says, which will purify this space. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay. So you have to pay attention to um, how blood is applied in a sacrifice. It's this idea of blood manipulation. That's what the Leviticus scholars call it. Um, so a sacrifice is offered, the animal is killed, and then the priest does something very specific with the blood. And you have to follow the blood to know what's going on here in the book of Leviticus. And let's see, what does Michael Heiser say? He says that blood is never applied to the offerer. Rather, the blood is applied to the sanctuary. Where does the blood go? You put the blood on the sanctuary to purge it of pollution. The emphasis is not on the offerer. Rather, the emphasis is on the sacred space, purifying it and making it fit for Yahweh's presence again after it has been violated. Now, this is, maybe I'm introducing some new concepts to you and it's about to get even more complicated. So buckle your seatbelt. Let's take a look at Leviticus 4. So Leviticus 4 is the sin offering. I want to go down to verse 27. And it says that if any of the common people sins unintentionally, he's got to bring a sin offering. And what do you do with the blood of that sin offering? Look at verse 30. The priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering. That's where the blood goes. It goes on the um, altar of burnt offering. That is, just so you know, here it is. This is the altar of burnt offering, um, and those are its little horns. <laughs> um, let's see. Can you see over my shoulder here? Here, here are the horns. Um, let's return now to uh, Leviticus 4, and if we zoom out, we see that this chapter, which is devoted to the sin offering, is divided in four different sections based upon the person who's bringing in the sin offering. First section is the anointed, anointed priest, which means the high priest. And then um, if the whole congregation sins, this is what you should do when a leader sins. And then finally, when a common person sins. Now let's take a look at the blood manipulation. Um, it feels like Halloween in each of these different sections. So we just saw that with the, the common person, it goes on the um, horns of the altar of burnt offering. Now look, when a leader sins, what do you do? Um, you shall take some of its blood and put it on the horns of um, the altar of burnt offering. Same thing, same exact rule for leader and common person. But this is where it gets important. You gotta pay attention to these details. Um, when the anointed priest, when the high priest sins, where does the blood go? Take some of the blood from the bull and bring it into the tent of meeting. So this is the, the tabernacle proper. This is the tent of meeting, and the blood needs to go into the tent. Um, let's see. And splash it in front of the veil of the sanctuary and put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant um, incense. So um, there's the altar of, of incense, and that's the veil which separates the holy space from the most holy space. And then quickly... We see that it's the same rule for when the whole congregation sins. Take some of the blood, bring it into the tent of meeting, splash it on the veil, on the horns of the incense offering as well. So, whew, what is going on here? This is some weird stuff. We see that there are, 
are two separate rules. So when a common person or when a leader commits a sin that requires a sin offering, um, you, you take the, uh, uh, the blood and you splash it only into this area outside of the tent. But when a high priest or the whole congregation sins, that blood must go into the tent. Now, why? Look what Richard Averbeck says. He says that the principle, which is explained that here, is that the blood went as far as the particular person, or um, so that's high priest, or the collective group of persons could go, and therefore decontaminated the tabernacle to that point. In other words, the blood penetrated the tabernacle as far as the contamination did. So a common person or a leader, he could go in this space, and therefore um, he contaminated this space, but a high priest or the whole congregation, which includes the high priest, could enter into here, and therefore this needs to be decontaminated too. That's pretty intense, but you realize that all of this is about God dwelling with his people. How does that happen? His space must remain holy, and the sin offering makes that happen. Now, we spent a lot of time on the sin offering. I want to take a look quickly at a couple of other offerings as well. Let's take a look now at the burnt offering. So the burnt offering, um, it's an important offering. It's kind of the, the default offering. It's the, the first one on our list. It's going to show up the most times in the Old Testament. And oftentimes, it's kind of tagged onto other offerings. So someone will offer a sin offering, and then they'll do a burnt offering too. They'll do a guilt offering, and then they'll do a burnt offering as well. And this word burnt um, is kind of a funny translation. It's an interpretive translation. I want to show you what the word actually is. So let's go to Leviticus 1.1. 1, 1. Leviticus. Here we are back here. I'm going to go to Leviticus 1.1. 1, 1, 1. Here we are. Laws for the burnt offering. Now, here's this word burnt, and the word is olah. It is the olah offering, which means to ascend or to go up. So, the burnt offering is the olah offering. So, that's our word olah, and it means to ascend, to go up. And the idea is that. Um, the animal that is wholly burned on the altar, the burnt offering is the only one where the animal is completely consumed on the altar. So it's an important point. Um, that animal rises up um, to God's presence as a pleasing aroma. And the idea is the person who offers the burnt offering, um, he kind of like symbolically then rises himself up to God's presence and enjoys a form of fellowship with God. So that's what the burnt offering is all about. And then Psalm 24 is going to kind of reflect on this a little bit. Psalm 24. Let's take a look at it. Okay, Psalm 24. King of glory. Okay. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Awesome. It says here in verse 3, who shall ascend the hill of Yahweh. Ascend is Olah, who shall go up to the hill of Yahweh? Well, only one who is clean and pure, just like the, the burnt offering. It says that the burnt offering must be an animal that is without blemish. But who else is without blemish? Who else is clean and pure? Well, the king of glory is. And the king of glory, one day, he is going to enter into the gates of Jerusalem as an offering for sin. I think you know who I'm talking about when I say king of glory. And then finally, um, let's take a look. So that was our burnt offering. Let's take a look at the peace offering. Peace offering is a party. Um, so I said with the burnt offering, that's the only one that's completely consumed. Um, the other offerings, they're actually, uh, only parts of it is consumed on the altar. The other parts are eaten. They're actually consumed by eating um, either by the priests or the person who actually offers the offering. And that's the case with, with a peace offering. Let's take a look at Leviticus 7. All right, let's go back to Leviticus. Let's zoom in a little bit. Okay, 7 verse 11. This is the law for the peace offerings. By the way, peace is shalom. Kind of neat. Verse 15. 
Um, the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. It's, a, it's an offering that is consumed. And then uh, Deuteronomy 12 is going to give us a little more details about this. And Deuteronomy 12 is going to tell us that the peace offering um, is a, a time of celebration, of joy, of rejoicing, and that it's, it's wonderful. So that's, that's what sacrifices aren't just this negative humdrum thing but it's a time of, of, of joy. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 12. All right, Deuteronomy 12, what do you have to contribute? So it says that you shall seek the place where Yahweh will choose out of all your tribes to make his habitation there. His, later it will be his temple. There you will go and there you will bring your burnt offerings, your Olah offerings, but also your vow offerings and your free will offerings. These are two different kinds of peace offerings. And there you shall eat before Yahweh your God, and you shall rejoice. Now, this, this idea of eating before Yahweh is eating in his presence. And this word rejoice is going to be used three times here in Deuteronomy. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And in each time, it's talking about um, <clears throat> rejoicing, following a fellowship meal. And in verse 12, it says, um, you shall bring your finest vow offerings to the Lord, and you shall rejoice before him you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants, your female servants, the Levite who's in your town, anyone who doesn't have an inheritance, invite all these people over, say, come on, enjoy um, God's blessing on us. I'm going to offer a peace offering, and I want to celebrate with you and with my God. I mean, peace offerings are awesome. Um, and this idea of worship with the sacrifice, it's going to be communicated in the ritual feasts as well. I mean, you think about the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Booths are all about celebrating and worshiping God. Um, but at the center of Leviticus is a special feast with a different purpose. We're gonna take a look at that feast next. <laughs> 